Well, I will go ahead and call our meeting to order. And we will start with our minutes of the last meeting, Jim. Okay. The Going State District Heritage Associating meeting was called to order by President Jack Baker at 10.07 a.m. with 15 members and guests present virtually. 37 people have viewed the YouTube video. Secretary Jim Terry read the minutes of the February meeting and they were approved as given. There was no financial report. Mary Bell, Mary Bell Chase gave her Cherokee moment presentation about how the public school system in the Cherokee Nation was established. Luke Williams asked the membership for volunteers to host Zoom meetings. Andy Squires and Jim Terry volunteered to co-host. Luke will be sending out an email to members asking for volunteers to recruit speakers for our meetings and volunteers to answer history and ancestry questions. Jack Baker announced that Going State member Jimmy Johnson died in Claremore recently. He was about 82 years old. David Hampton reminded us of the Oklahoma Trail of Tears Association Spring Meeting will be held at the Shota Center next to the casino in Tahlequah on Saturday, April 21st at 10 a.m. The featured speaker, Anna Finger Smith from North Carolina, will give a presentation on the genesis of the Cherokee Eastern Band. Jack Baker and guest speaker Michael Wren told us about their recent research trip to the Tennessee State Library and Archives to view records of the 1838 and 1842 Cherokee claims and about many other Cherokee records that can be found there. President Jack Baker adjourned the meeting at 11.30 a.m. Thanks, Jim. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, I would entertain a motion that they be approved as read. I so move. Okay, Curtis, is there a second? I second. Okay, Becky seconded. Okay, all in favor say aye or a thumbs up. Aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Jim, did you get a treasurer's report? Yes, I did. I'll read that if you want. Okay, please. Because Ruth, I think, still isn't doing very well. But I talked with her earlier in the week, and she's still doing physical therapy from her fall of several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, beginning balance is $6,418. Uh, we had income from dues of $3,213, uh, coming to a total of $9,631. We paid out $2,025, and that gives us a total as of April 15th of 2022 of $7,000. $35. The CD balance is $8,691. Total monies as of the 15th of April 2022 is $15,726.64. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Are there, is there any discussion on the treasurer's report? If not, we will prove it as given. Okay. Mary Bell, do you have your Cherokee moments for us? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my Cherokee moments for this morning is the special files of the Office of Indian Affairs, 1807 to 1904. And uh, these are located on uh, National Archives microfilm publications microcopy number 574 and this the particular records that i'm going to read to you this morning are located on a roll number 32 special files of the office of indian affairs 1807 to 1904 and these particular records are located in file 154 so keep in mind this file number, file number 154. 
and the first document that I'm going to read, and this this particular um, uh, uh, special files in row 32, there are so many more uh, records than what I'm going to read. I'm just giving you uh, an example of what can be found. Uh, and this first document is Cherokee Nation West, Cherokee Agency. Now on this day before me, RCS Brown, Cherokee agent, personally came Eliza Wolf, a Cherokee woman who after being duly sworn, states that she and Betsy Covell, each of whom are named in, in her affidavit, heretofore made before Governor Butler, uh, when agent for the Cherokee Nation, uh, sworn to on the third day of April, 1845, are both Cherokee, each of whom have heretofore resided for many years in the Cherokee Nation East, were recognized there by the authorities, and entitled to the usual privileges of other Cherokees. Affiant states that she and Betsy Covell were sisters and that in the May 1838, their father, Little Turtle, a Cherokee died and their mother having been dead for several years. Their father requested that his children generally should be under the charge and control of Dr. Eliza Butler, a missionary of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Affiant further states that she and her sister Betsy Covell left the old Cherokee Nation in the month of April 1839 in company with Dr. Eliza Butler, missionary as aforesaid, and his family for the Cherokee Nation West and arrived in Western Cherokee Nation sometime in the month of June, same year, and Affiant and said Betsy Covell have both resided in the Western Cherokee Nation ever since and are recognized by the Cherokee authorities, entitled to the usual privileges of other Cherokees. Affiant states further, she nor her sister never were enrolled to the best of her knowledge in any family or company for immigration. That she and her sister removed from the Eastern to the Western Cherokee Nation and subsisted themselves during such, during such removal. And for 12 months after upon their own exclusive means. Affiant further states that she nor her sister never were before removed at the expense of the United States nor the Cherokee people or by anyone who was paid therefore, and that neither she nor her sister ever have at any time received from the United States any commutation of transportation and subsistence either in money or in kind, save the $34.40 as specified in her affidavit, made before Governor Butler and now on file, which said amount was handed to a fiant and her sister by Dr. Eliza Butler. F farther, the deponent saith not. And this was uh, her, uh, her signature, Eliza T. Wolf. Sworn, sworn to and subscribed before me this 27th day of May, 1848, before RCS Brown, Cherokee agent. And at this time, I'd like to just make one comment. And most of you know that uh, according to the Treaty of 1835, uh, each Cherokee was to be subsisted for at least 12 months. Uh, after removal. The next item is Cherokee Nation East, February the 15th, 1838. George Fields, a Cherokee from Grasshopper Creek, is permitted to remove himself and family, consisting of eight persons, self, 
wife, one son under 10, two daughters under 10, and three over 10 years of age to the country assigned the Cherokees west of the Mississippi, having commuted the transportation. He will report to the agent of the Cherokees on his arrival in the Cherokee Nation West. And this document is signed by Nat Nathaniel Smith, who was superintendent of the Cherokee removal. And uh, further information on this particular uh, document is a true copy from the original left with me this day to be forwarded to Washington City to be compared, verified, and returned for payment. And this was done at the Cherokee Agency the 1st of March, 1845. And at this time, P.M. Butler was the Cherokee agent. And then here is his affidavit. Personally appeared before me, George Fields, who being sworn says that he is the owner and has in possession a certificate of which the above is a copy. And he has never received any pay from the United States government for subsistence to which said certificate entitles him. And uh, uh, this was uh, his signature, George Fields at uh, Grasshopper Creek. And the next one is Cherokee Agency, 19th of November, 1838. Nellie Martin, the bearer and head of a Cherokee family, is permitted to remove herself and family consisting of four sons and one daughter over 10 and an orphan girl under 10 years of age to the country assigned the Cherokees west of the Mississippi. She having been paid $160 for their transportation, she will report to the agent of the Cherokees on her arrival west. And this was uh, signed by Nathaniel Smith superintendent of Cherokee removal. And the next one is Cherokee Nation East, May the 14th, 1838. David M. Harlan, having commuted the, the transportation, is permitted to remove himself, wife, two sons under 10 years of age, and one daughter under 10 to the country assigned the Cherokees west of the Mississippi. He will report to the agent of the Cherokees on his arrival in the Cherokee Nation West. And this of course was signed by Nathaniel Smith, who was superintendent of the, the Cherokee removal. And the next one, Cherokee Nation East, November the 7th, 1838. Samuel W. Bell, a Cherokee having commuted the transportation is permitted to remove himself and male slave to the country assigned the Cherokees west of the Mississippi. He will report to the agent of the Cherokees on his, on his arrival in the Cherokee Nation West. And this was done by Nathaniel Smith. And then the next one is Cherokee Nation, Fort Gibson personally appeared before me, P.M. Butler, Cherokee agent, Samuel May Mays, who being duly sworn and makes oath that he is personally knowing to William Dameron, and this is in parentheses, who has a Cherokee family, emigrating and subsisting himself and family on their removal from the Cherokee Nation East under the Treaty of 1835. In the spring of 1838, he obtained a certificate from General Nathaniel Smith, who was then immigrating agent, certifying that he, William Dameron, did immigrate and subsist himself as provided for, which certificate he filed with Captain Stevenson, then who was dispersing agent. And this signature was Samuel Mays, and it was sworn to and subscribed before me this ninth day of May, 1842, uh, in, 
in with uh, P.M. Butler, Cherokee agent. And uh, Jack, do I have time for uh, a couple more? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cherokee Nation West, Cherokee Nation. Be it remembered that on this 12th day of July, 1848, personally appeared before me, Richard C.S. Brown, who was United States agent for the Cherokee tribe of Indians, came Richard Foreman, and this is in parentheses, called by some Bart Foreman, end of parentheses, who being duly sworn states that he is a Cherokee and that he has a white woman for a wife and has several Cherokee children, that he married and lived in the old Cherokee Nation East for many years, was together with his, with his family, recognized as Cherokee by the authorities of the nation. Himself and family were all entitled to the usual privileges of other Cherokees and left the, Cher the Eastern Nation in the month of March, 1848, and arrived in the Western Cherokee Nation in the month of May last, as well as he recollects with his family, namely. And here's where it names each one of his children. It gives their names and his daughter and her children's names. Number one, myself, Richard Foreman, in parentheses, called by some, Bark, and a parentheses, over 10 years old. Number two, Archie Foreman, over 10 years old. Number three, Anthony Foreman, over 10 years old. Number four, Anna Foreman, over 10 years old. Number five, Susan Foreman, over 10 years old. Number six, Stephen Foreman, over 10 years old. Number seven, Daniel Foreman, under 10 years old. Number eight, Catherine Foreman, under 10 years old. Number nine, Robert Foreman, under 10 years old. Number 10, Martha Foreman, under 10 years old. Number 11, my wife, Rachel Foreman, over 10 years old. And the above enumerated individuals are my immediate family who are now under my charge and control. And the following enumerated persons, namely, are my daughter and her children, to wit, and here's her daughter, his daughter, number 12, Jane Hyman, over 10 years old, number 13, George Washington Foreman, under 10 years old, number 14, Columbus Foreman, under 10 years old. The affiant states that all of the above enumerated constituted his family prior to leaving the Cherokee Nation East, and that he has, at his own individual and exclusive expense, removed to the Cherokee Nation West. Affiant states that there was no enrolling agent in the East Cherokee Nation at the time he left with his family, in consequence of which he is not prepared to present the certificate of that officer that himself and family, to the best of his belief, have been enrolled for immigration some years since for the West and never did remove from the Eastern to the Western Cherokee Nation until now nor never was removed at the expense of the United States or the Cherokee people. Affiant states that he was considered at the head of his family of 14, that he removed to this country, that his daughter above enumerated together with her two children are at the special request of the said Jane Hyman placed in this my application for transportation and subsistence and that she will file or cause to be filed here in this affidavit 
uh, bro, uh, let's see, Affine states, excuse me, Affine states that himself and family are recognized by the authorities here as Cherokees and have such privileges as other Cherokees in this nation. Affine further states that he has not at any time received any commutation of transportation or subsistence from the United States, either in money or in kind for the removal of his family. And then it's signed by Richard Foreman and in print, well, it's done with his mark. He didn't sign his signature, but it was done with his mark. And then in parentheses, called by some Bark Foreman. So if you see in the records Bark Foreman, you'll know that at one time he was called Richard Foreman or vice versa. Uh, that concludes that part of uh, the what I wanted to read to you, but I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, these special files, and there are numerous roles of this microfilm, uh, these refer back to letters received by the Office of Indian Affairs, 1824 to 1881. And where you see in the, in the document, in letters received, it will indicate if there's a special file for that particular document. And if there is a special file, usually over to the right-hand side of the document, it will say, such as in this case, file number 154, so that you can go to the special files and find out additional information about the particular document that you read in letters received. And I just want to throw this out. In my opinion, this collection is one of, the, I'm talking about letters received. Uh, in my opinion, this collection is one of the most important collections of Cherokee records that is currently available. And uh, I think this collection and the, the uh, special files would make a good talk indicating examples of the special files, giving additional information concerning the document that is in letters received by the Office of Indian Affairs. And I just toss this suggestion out to Jack or Mike or Brett. <laughs> and excuse me for that, I couldn't help it. <laughs> that concludes my... That includes my Cherokee moments for this morning. Okay. Hey, and, could I ask Mary Bell a question? Yes. Hey, um, hi. Um, I have been looking to find out if there, and I'm, I'm asking this question because you seem to have a lot of information about where records are found um, and where you might be able to deep dive into some of these things. Um, I'm wondering if, is there any source that you know of for the Kuaskui district um, in the 1800s, say in the 1870s or 1880s, where there are any, you know, like significant records or letters or documents. Uh, yes, that there I is. Can go. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, at, the, at the Oklahoma History Center in Oklahoma City, and I'm not sure what's online, what they put online. But there, they have the district records after removal for certain years, and it's not going to include all of the years. But you'll find several reels of microfilm for Kui Skui District of the district records, and it may give marriages. There may be deaths listed in there. It's just a just a variety of records that were kept in the each district. And these records are now in Oklahoma City History Center. So you can access uh, those. You can go there and research if you want to. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This, by the way, the foremans were Wanda's family. Did you want to comment, Wanda? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Mary Bell, for reading that. Uh, Richard Bart Foreman is my third great-grandfather. And his daughter, Susan, 
that's listed there is my is my direct ancestor and uh, the daughter with the two children jane that he mentioned separately from this group are by a, a different uh mother but no one that i've ever talked to has been able to find out her identification it always just lists jane as a half sister and uh, but i i was surprised to find her and her children listed with them yes uh, when at the time of the removal rachel was sick and i have some of the paperwork uh from that time when he requested permission to stay in the east due to his wife's illness and he had to have letters <coughs> saying that he was um, able to support his family and in that support letter it says that he had uh, some knowledge of medicine and that he treated people in the area and he was accepted well you know to do that he had to uh, let go his Cherokee citizenship and become a U.S. citizen and shortly after the trail then he and his family were traveling to visit uh, someone in the family who was ill and when they came back a oh, white yeah. family had moved into their house and they were never able to regain their their house and so they finally came west because of that and then he had to reapply for his citizenship since he was no longer listed as a Cherokee citizen mm -hmm. so how uh, interesting you. And Thank that's you. why he removed later. Uh, yes. It didn't give the reason in this particular document, but it did indicate that he removed later and didn't come with the, the general removal. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Oh, it's certainly. And I wasn't aware that that was your ancestor, but I'm glad that it, that it was. Yes, <laughs> that it you. turned out that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he also has a medicine book listing the various herbs and stuff to use for cures. And that has been published. Yes, I have a copy of that. Yep. It's That's interesting. Yes. Okay. And by the way, those special files, as well as the letters sent and received by the Office of Indian Affairs, are actually online through Family Search which is the Mormon website. Oh, and that's good to know. So there, so you can locate all of those through there and they're very good copies because I use those. So, okay. Well, be prepared to research for years to come in those records because it's a massive collection. Yes, it so. is. <laughs> so, okay. Appreciate it. Do we have any old business? So Curtis, you want to tell us about what's happening next Saturday? Well, that's our uh, spring meeting for the Oklahoma chapter, finally after two years. Uh, and it's going to be at the Chota Center in Tahlequah. Uh, and David has uh, done a great job in coordinating all of that. And uh, bringing in our guest speaker, Anita Fingersmith. Curtis, Curtis, I want to mention about Andy set us up for Zoom link. So if anybody, if you're a member of the Oklahoma chapter, you should have gotten an email with a Zoom link. In. If you're not a member of the Oklahoma chapter, you can send an email to Oklahoma Tota at gmail.com and we will send you a, and I'll send you a, uh, a link to the meeting if you want to attend by Zoom. Very good. Is there any other old or new business to cover? Okay. Well, it was 150 years ago yesterday.
that there was a, what's it's become known as the Going Snake tragedy occurred in the Going Snake district of the Cherokee Nation. So back up, on February 13th of 1872, Ezekiel Proctor rode from his home a few miles west to the Hildebrand Mill located on Flint Creek. The mill had been built about 1845 by Jeremiah Towers, who by the way was an ancestor of our late members, Barbara Dunlap and her daughter, Jerry Wood. And Towers imported the stone burrs for grinding from France. They were shipped to New Orleans and from there came upstream to Fort Gibson and then overland to the mill site. And Towers sold the mill to Peter Hildebrand who expanded it. He allegedly paid two Irishmen $2,000 to expand the mill trace from four feet deep and four feet across to eight feet deep and eight feet wide. And on Google, you can still, you can see this on Google Maps. And this is the, is that mill trace and for the mill stream. And this was the location of the mill. And then this is Flint Creek flowing along here. And that original mill burned in 1892. It was rebuilt by a three-story, or replaced by a three-story building, which unfortunately deteriorated and is no longer there. Although I believe the mill wheel and some other items are still there. And of course, the mill trace, which is amazing, is, which is cut through solid limestone. As you can see, it, it's there, but it, it's amazing to see in person. And it was about 300 feet long. So Peter Hildebrand died January 10th, 1867. And after his death, his widow, Mary Pauline, known as Polly Beck, hired a white man named James Casterson to operate the mill. And then Polly and Casterson married on March 18th of 1871. So the reason for Proctor's trip to the mill was to confront Casterson. And there are varying st stories as to why he was confronting him. One is that Casterson accused Proctor of stealing cattle from them. Another is that Proctor was upset because Casterson, who had been married to Proctor's sister Elizabeth, abandoned her and their children after moving them from Going State District to Canadian District. And Zeke had to go to Canadian District and bring her back to their home. But whatever the reason, Proctor and Kesterson got into an altercation. Proctor pulled a gun, planning to shoot Kesterson. Polly jumped between them and Proctor accidentally shot and killed her. So Proctor immediately went to the sheriff of Going State District, John R. Wright, known as Jack Wright, and surrendered himself up for trial for the killing of Polly Kesterson. And he was placed under guard until his trial, which began in April. So the following is the official report given by Sheriff Wright of the tragedy in Going State District. In Going State District, April 16, 1872. To His Excellency, Lewis Downing, Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. Sir, in my capacity of Sheriff and as an Executive Officer of the Government, I deem it my duty to report to you an event connected with my position and duties, which may be or may become of national importance. Ezekiel Proctor, a citizen by birth of the Cherokee Nation, had been arrested by me, or rather had been held under arrest by me, he having voluntarily submitted himself for trial. And on yesterday, the 15th instant, his trial was progressing at the regular place of holding court in this district. And this is a map in one part of Adair County. See, there's Highway 62, which goes to Westville. And here's a community of Christie. There's a Christie store. The school was right along here. And this is the Barren Fork Creek. So this was the old Going Snake Courthouse. But they had moved the court to the school, which was a better place for holding court, and they were expecting a large crowd. So it was here. And then 
right here, this was the Whitmire house, and this is the Whitmire Cemetery. And the cemetery, of course, is still there. So back to his report, it says, previously, that is at the second calling of the court in this case, I had been applied to by person professing to be a, a United States Deputy Marshal to relinquish position, excuse me, possession of said prisoner to him in pursuance of a writ said by him to have been obtained outside of this nation. This application I refused decisively, being assured that I should be quit of my lawful obligation to hold any citizen once legally arrested only upon an order from my superior executive officer to wit the acting principal chief and such order had not been produced. The person referred to claiming to be a United States Deputy Marshal received my decision and replied with expressions of such plain indifference, if not contempt, of the course of justice of our nation and also with such evident intention of returning to accomplish his purpose by force, that I felt authorized to and did increase the guard to a number sufficient, in my opinion, to overawe all such attempts. This I did under the view that as I had described, not to deliver the prisoner up. It was my consistent duty to guard and protect him against being violently taken from under my charge by any person not having proper authority to make demand for him. So the matter stood till the temporary adjournment of the court caused by certain changes made as I understand by the prosecution against the presiding judge, since which time the number of guard was reduced to the customary limit, nothing having been heard further of any attempt to be made to rescue the prisoner from the Cherokee authorities. Matters were in this position up to yesterday when, while the court was in session, an assault was made upon the court by a party of white men and Cherokee citizens combined with the plain purpose of either taking the prisoner by force or killing him. The said assault was made in this manner to wit. While the court was peaceably progressing, a party of about 10 men, most of them white and some entire strangers to me, headed by a Cherokee concerned in the prosecution of the case, came riding up to the court ground, dismounted, formed in column and marched toward the courthouse, cocking their guns on the way. No notice was taken of them by address, nor did they say a word until one of the foremost, named Sutback, having a double barrel shotgun in his hand, cocked and presented, gave me an order to get out of the way. And a moment afterward, one of the same party fired into the house at someone said to be the prisoner. The fact that the party was led by the most active of those engaged in prosecuting and their unmistakable hostile demonstrations against the prisoner who was soon shot and so far as I can learn at the first fire determined the guard to resist, which they did. And a scene of terrible slaughter immediately ensued, excuse me, ensued which it is impossible accurately to describe. The guard were substantial men whom I could trust, and as sworn officers of the law, were responsible for the safekeeping and protection of the prisoner, independent of any orders from myself. From the most reliable information I can get after the prisoner was wounded, Judge Mose Alberti, attorney for the defense, was shot while sitting at the clerk's table reading the evidence of the case. This gentleman died in his seat without speaking a word one or both barrels of a shotgun having been emptied in his breast by one of the assaulting party just outside the door. Samuel Beck, who was in front of the attacking column, then fell and died. The defendants then transferred the fight entirely outside of the small building, crammed as it was by the jury, judge, and spectators by stepping outside. This, no doubt, would have been done before by my order or otherwise had the least apprehension been entertained by the authorities interested that an assault of force so deadly was about to be made. A part of the guard, however, were outside at the time, excuse me, were outside at the time the firing commenced and soon the battle raged around the building. It is not necessary to particularize the time and circumstances immediately connected with the fall of each victim of this unexpected 
unprovoked, and I may say wholly unwarranted attack upon those concerned in the administration of justice in our country, even if I were able to state it all reliably. Suffice it to say that the fight is estimated to have lasted 10 or 15 minutes. The assailants then fled and the authorities and citizens on the ground occupied themselves with taking care of the wounded and dead of both sides without distinction. Eight dead were hauled to the nearest residence from the court building and outside. One more was found back of the house a short distance where he had run and fell after being mortally wounded. Another is said to have been found about a quarter of a mile off in the direction the retreating party took, but I cannot vouch for this. The court, after the combat was over and no evidence of a continuance of the interruption appearing, adjourned till the next day, and all parties were soon engaged in the melancholy task of providing for the wounded and disposing of the dead. Of the former, Deputy Marshal Owen was shot through and taken to Mrs. Whitmire's, where he received every attention possible under the circumstances. His Honor, the presiding judge, B.H. Sixkiller, was severely wounded in the wrist. The prisoner, as before stated, was seriously wounded in the leg at the beginning of the affray, the bullet remaining in the bone. William Beck was desperately wounded in the body, Isaac Van badly in the elbow. Suck Beck, known as White Suck, who took the lead in the onslaught, is reported to be very badly wounded. One of the jurymen was shot through the shoulder. Several others are said to have been slightly wounded. The dead, as far as I can learn, are Judge Mose Alberti, Andy Pallone, Johnson Proctor, of whom Proctor and Alberti were unarmed and not engaged in men of years. Both were killed by the assailants. Of the Becks, Samuel and Sutt, known as Black Sutt, were killed. Those who were engaged with them in making the assault were killed were William Hicks and a son-in-law of the late Polly Casterson and two others whose names I'm unable to give at present. I have thought it my duty to be thus particular in giving an account of this deplorable affair that should the national authorities see proper to move in the matter, it may do so upon his correct information as an officer on the ground at the time it first took place could give. My duty being first principally to the nation, I have no prejudice or feelings to indulge, either in acting myself or in relating, as in this case, the actions of others. I have only further to state that even if it were proper for the deputy marshal to forcibly seize a prisoner from under charge of a Cherokee guard, and that during the holding of court for his trial, I cannot but think that a violent assault of the kind described, without previous warning, information, or demand whatever, is totally indefensible and unjustifiable. Having been informed by one of the deputy marshals that I would be held responsible personally for the resistance made by the guard. I feel it to be my duty to make a truthful statement of all the facts connected with the occurrences in my knowledge and ask for instruction and such support as the case in my position may require and justify. An important fact bearing upon the affair in a legal view is that Deputy Marshal Owens declares that he in vain attempted to restrain, excuse me, restrain some of those who came with him, and that the arbitrary proceeding of interrupting the court then sitting in the manner in which it was done was in direct disobedience of his orders. This only serves to show that he condemned the conduct of his party, which precipitated the conflict, as such orders could not possibly have been expected to control or determine the conduct of the guard and authorities of the court, since they were not delivered in the hearing of the latter and there was not the slightest ground to infer from anything said by the, by the responsible members of the attacking party, if any, that they were acting only upon their own responsibility, while their activities intimated as plainly as possible that they were bent on bloody mischief. And that's the end of his report. By the way, he talked about Deputy Marshall Owens, because Deputy Owens was... Uh, 
wounded, but then he died later that night. And many years later, Dr. T.L. Ballinger, late history professor at Northeastern State University, contacted Eugene L. Bracken, who was one of Major Owen's deputies. And this is Major Bracken's description of what occurred. Excuse me, Mr. Bracken's. We stopped at a little fringe of trees a short distance from the schoolhouse and tied our horses and marched up to the door. Just as we reached the building, a fine looking Indian stepped in front of us and said, walk right in gentlemen. At that instant, without one word of warning, White Sut Beck had caught sight of his enemy, Zeke Proctor, and throwing his gun forward, fired. The room was crowded and I saw a hand reach out and press down the muzzle of his gun as he pressed the trigger. And the next instant, the battle was on. Boom, bang, bang, bang. We were so close together that our guns almost touched each other's bodies. Proctor had a number of his friends guarding him and they poured a deadly fire into our faces. And the ones we had seen leaving the building were adding their quota to the hot lead being poured into our midst. The man in front of me fell and the one in the rear crumpled up like a wilted leaf. I happened to be in the center and they had caught the bullets that would have pierced me if I had been on the outside line. It takes a long time to write this, but it did not take more than a minute for it to happen. I fired my shotgun and backed away from the door, which was still pouring forth its deadly hail of bullets and buckshot, which made the air sound as if filled with angry bees. As I looked around for my companions, I could only see their bodies lying about on the ground, and a few of them scattered in firing a shot once in a while, but the odds against us were so overwhelming that we were practically annihilated at the first fire, and I turned and ran in a diagonal direction toward the timber. Just as I turned, Proctor, who had seized his own Spencer carbine from one of the guards, sprang out of the door and fired at me, but just missed me by a hair's breadth. The heavy ounce ball just grazed by my right ear, sounding like a circular saw. He immediately turned and shot William, or Black Sut, back, as he was called, through the body. White Sut, the one who had caused all of our trouble, got off with a pistol ball through the shoulder. By this time, I had reached the timber and did not stop until I put the creek between me and that ghastly sight. So William Penn Boudinot, who's editor of the Cherokee Advocate, wrote the following account, which was published in the Advocate. This terrible tragedy, attack upon a Cherokee court. From time to time, we have chronicled the postponement of the case of Ezekiel Proctor, charged with the murder of Polly Hildebrand, the last trial being set to come off last Monday, 15th instant. We had business there and arrived about half past one o'clock. By the way, the battle was said to have, in various accounts, started around 11 or 11.30. And what a sight met our gaze when we rode up to the small schoolhouse where the court had been called. Three men were lying just before the doorstep and those negligent and still postures so terrifying to the living. Dark pools of blood issuing from each told the horrible story of the manner of their death. In the house, lying side by side with their hats over their faces, lay three more bodies. One, all that was left of an old and valued friend. A few steps off to the right of the door lay the body of a man with light hair and blue eyes, which betokened his white extraction. Next to the chimney, behind the house was another, and nearby, partly supported against the wall, was a man groaning in the anguish of a desperate wound. In the bushes a little farther off was yet another corpse of a youth who had staggered there to die. Looking at the living, we saw the presiding judge, B.H. Sixkiller, with his wrist bandaged for he had been seriously wounded by two bullets. The prisoner was limping about with a bullet in the bone of his leg below the knee. Others were wounded more or less. 
at the nearest resident was lying desperately wounded, Deputy Marshal Owens, a man generally respected on both sides of the line. Some of the badly wounded we did not see. They had been fled or been taken care of by their friends. The spectacle which harrowed our sight was the most awful without any comparison that we have ever witnessed. And then he goes on to relate much of what was in uh, Sheriff Wright's letter. The dead on the side of the marshals and the Becks were Samuel Beck, William Beck, Black Sat Beck, William Hicks, Riley Woods, George Salvage, James Ward, and U.S. Marshal James G. Owen. Marshal Owens was wounded and died, as I said later, and I believe it was William Beck who was also wounded and died later that night. And those on the Proctor side were Johnson Proctor, brother of Ezekiel, or a half-brother, Mose Alberti, Ezekiel's uh, attorney, and Andrew Pallone. And the wounded were white set back in the shoulder, Ezekiel Proctor in the knee, John Proctor, who was Ezekiel's nephew, Ellis Foreman in the shoulder, Isaac Van was a nephew of Ezekiel, and he was wounded in the arm, Black Hawk Six Killer, the presiding judge, in the wrist, and Paul Jones, one of the posse, in the jaw and leg. So the proceedings in the trial were reported by the clerk of the circuit court, Joseph M. Starr as follows. Copy of the last two days proceedings in the trial of Ezekiel Proctor. Monday, April 15th, 1872. The Special Circuit Court of Going Snake District met in pursuance to a call by the Special Presiding Judge Honorable Blackhawk Six Killer for the continuance of the trial of Ezekiel Proctor charged with the murder of Polly Casterson. Prisoner and jury as impaneled at last court present. The solicitor demanded and disputed the authority of the judge to set in this trial, questioning the power of the executive to give him authority to proceed after suspending. The answer of defense was that the presiding judge had not been suspended, but only called before the executive council to determine whether to suspend him or not on the charges preferred, and that the question had been determined in the negative and the court ordered to proceed, which order authority was being obeyed now. During the progress of the discussion, an armed force of mixed whites and Cherokee citizens, the latter being concerned in the prosecution, made a murderous attack upon the prisoner without any intimation of their intentions. And a prom promiscuous shooting immediately took place in which his honor was wounded as also with some of the jurymen and a number of the men attending the ground killed. This unexpected and dreadful procedure broke up the trial for the day and the court was adjourned until tomorrow, nine o'clock. The rest of the day was taken up with attending upon the wounded and the dead. Tuesday, April 16th, 150 years ago today, court in consideration of the safety of those connected with the trial and apprehending another possible interruption of the proceedings similar to yesterday, having due regard to the preservation of the public peace and the security of individuals, was called to meet near the Whitmire Place to wit at the residence of Art Scraper. Due notification of the place so selected had been given at the place of holding court the day before and all of the jury were present who were able to attend. Another good and sufficient reason for meeting here was that the prisoner was seriously wounded yesterday and was lying at said scrapers, unable to move with safety, but not waiving his right to be present at the trial. In consideration of the necessity of proceeding with the trial, if possible, and for the reasons stated above, the court was called and held accordingly and the prisoner not waiving his right to be present. Present prisoner and all the jury but one 
who had been wounded and was unable to attend. The court impaneled another one, according to the form prescribed by law, to fill the place of the one unavoidably absent, after which the evidence was closed on part of the defense and the case submitted to the jury who returned with the following verdict. We, the jury, find the prisoner not guilty, signed Arch Scraper Foreman. And the court then adjourned, signed die. Black Hawk Six Killer, judge of the special call circuit court of Boeing State District, and Joseph M. Starr, clerk of the circuit court, Boeing State District. And the reason the posse had come to the court proceedings was to arrest Proctor, providing that he was acquitted in the death of Polly Casterson for the attempted murder of James Casterson. Kesterson swore out a warrant against Proctor. United States of America, Western District of Arkansas. J.J. Kesterson, being duly sworn, says that Ezekiel Proctor, an Indian, did in the Indian country, Western District of Arkansas, on or about the 13th day of February, A.D. 1872, commit an assault with a deadly weapon with an attempt to kill this defiant, J.J. Kesterson, a white man. Contrary to law, and praise a warrant for his arrest, signed J.J. Kesterson. Sworn to and subscribed before me this 11th day of April, A.D. 1872. James O. Churchill, U.S. Commissioner. Witnesses J.J. Kesterson, P.C. Hodgkiss, and Steeny Thompson. Now, the Cherokee Treaty of 1866 had two articles dealing with the courts in the Cherokee Nation. Article 7 states the United States court to be created in the Indian Territory and until such court is created in their end, the United States District Court, the nearest to the Cherokee Nation, shall have exclusive original jurisdiction of all causes, civil and criminal, when an inhabitant of the district here before described shall be a party and we're an inhabitant outside of said district, that is outside of the Cherokee Nation, shall be the other party. And the nearest court, as you mentioned, to the Cherokee Nation, of course, was a federal court at Fort Smith, who had jurisdiction since no federal court had been established in the Cherokee Nation. Article 13 states, which also mentions the court, the Cherokee also agree that a court or courts may be established by the United States in said territory with such jurisdiction and organized in such manner as we shall be prescribed by law, provided that the judicial tribunals of the Cherokee Nation shall be allowed to retain exclusive jurisdiction in all civil and criminal cases arising within their country in which members of the nation by nativity or adoption shall be the only parties or where the cause of action shall rise in the Cherokee Nation except as otherwise provided in this treaty. So James Kesterson, by his marriage to Polly Beck Hildebrand, became an adopted citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And under the terms of the treaty, he was subject to the laws and courts of the Cherokee Nation. The federal court at Fort Smith had no jurisdiction and therefore no right to send a posse to the Boeing State District to serve the warrant. And this jurisdictional issue eventually reached President U.S. Grant, who issued the following only three weeks later. Executive Mansion, May 7, 1872, to the Senate of the United States. I herewith communicate to the Senate a report from the Acting Secretary of the Interior of this day in answer to the resolution of that body adopted on the 23rd Ultimo, calling for information relative to the recent affray at the courthouse in Boeing State District, Indian Territory. In view of the feeling of hostility which exists between the Cherokees and the United States authorities on the Western District of Arkansas, it seems to be necessary that Congress should adopt such measures as will tend to allay that feeling at the same time 
secure the enforcement of the laws on that territory. I therefore concur with the Acting Secretary of the Interior in suggesting the adoption of a pending bill for the erection of a judicial district within the Indian Territory as a measure which will afford the most immediate remedy for the existing troubles, signed U.S. Grant. So Sheriff Jack Wright was right whenever he stated that this may affair may become of national importance. But even though here in 1872, President Grant stated the court should be established in Indian Territory, the federal court was not established in Indian Territory until 1890 when courts were established at Muskogee, McAllister, and Ardmore. And meanwhile, the event at Point Snake Courthouse created other problems that needed to be resolved between the Cherokee Nation and the federal court at Fort Smith. The federal court issued warrants for the rest of the judge, jury, and others involved in the court proceedings at Point Snake. And these were Ezekiel Proctor, Art Scraper, Tail Six Killer, Black Hawk Six Killer, John Walker, my third great-grandfather, Joseph Chewy, for whom the community of Chewy is named because the Ford the River was near his place, George Shell, Jesse Shell, John Shell, Edward Downing, Jim Brewer, John Walking Stick, John Creek, John Proctor, Mike Mitchell, Thomas Foreman, Ellis Foreman, Nelson Foreman, Isaac Van, Ned Steele, John Looney. And I'm sure this is, many of you also have family members mentioned in this. And some of these were arrested and taken to Fort Smith where they posted bond. There's testimony given in some of these cases which are very interesting. And the court records for the Western District of Arkansas the National Archives, Fort Worth Branch, and are all online at Ancestry. So the Cherokee Nation likewise issued warrants for the arrest of white suspect and other members of the attacking party. And it was not until late 1873 when the issue finally resolved. Cherokee agent John B. Jones wrote the Honorable H.R. Clum, Acting Commissioner of Indian Affairs, on October 29, 1873, detailing the resolution. And this, by the way, is from the letters received that Mary Bell mentioned earlier that has so much good information. The first part of the letter sort of recaps what happened uh, at the courthouse and talks about the shootings and people and so on. So I'll skip the first part of the letter. But it goes on to say, it is not necessary to give the names of all the killed and wounded. Most of the marshal's party had that morning been drinking, aware undoubtedly under the, and excuse me. Most of the marshal's party had that morning been drinking and were undoubtedly under the influence of liquor when they attacked the court. Marshal Owens was a sober man, but Marshal Peavy was not. There's but little doubt that Owens tried to restrain his colleagues and posse, but could not do so. Immediately after this bloody affair, warrants were issued by the U.S. District Court for Western District of Arkansas for Ezekiel Proctor, Judge B.H. Sixkiller, Captain Archgray performed of the jury, and several others, jurors, guards, and witnesses. Scraper and Ellis Foreman, who was a juror, were arrested and taken to Fort Smith for trial. Scraper was ironed and otherwise abused. Foreman was suffering from a wound received in the fight. They gave bail and the trial was put off. Others of those for whom warrants were issued surrendered as time elapsed and gave bail. Finally, the trial was appointed to come off at the fall term of the U.S. District Court of the Western District of Arkansas in 1873. While I was in Washington last summer, I addressed a communication to the Attorney General of the U.S. representing the facts in the case and setting forth that Scraper, 
Six Killer, and others for whom warrants had been issued were the victims rather than the criminals in this terrible affair. That the prosecution of these men was unjust and malicious. I requested that the Attorney General order the case dismissed. Honorable E.P. Smith, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, gave my recommendation his hearty endorsement. At his request, the Honorable Secretary of the Interior also endorsed my request. Through the kindness of the Honorable Commissioner and Secretary of the Interior, the attention of the Attorney General was called to the case. After investigation, he ordered the case dismissed. So this is the Attorney General of the United States. Soon after the fight in the spring of 1872, a warrant was issued for Sutbeck and others who were Cherokees and who belonged to the party which attacked the Cherokee court. This warrant was issued by the proper authorities of the Circuit Court for Going State District, Cherokee Nation. The charge was the murder of Johnson Proctor and others and the resistance to the officers and laws of the, United, of the Cherokee Nation. Beck left the Cherokee Nation. No great effort was made to take him or his comrades. The warrants, however, were not withdrawn. After the case of Scraper, Six Killers, and others was dismissed, their friends tried to bring about a reconciliation between them and Beck. Scraper and Six Killer were lenient towards Beck and those who attacked with him. So far as they were concerned, there was no trouble. Proctor, who is the only desperate man on Scraper's side, was willing to acquiesce in any action which Scraper and Six Killer and their friends might think best. Recently, Beck and one or two others came in voluntarily and surrendered to the Cherokee Sheriff. This, of course, rendered a trial necessary. Under the Cherokee law, there is no provision for the prosecution of entering a noli prosecute, which is to ignore it. Therefore, the trial would have gone on and the prisoners been either acquitted or convicted had it not been for the order of the principal chief suspending action. This order was procured in accordance with your telegraphic dispatch of the 13th instant. Scraper and Six Killer, etc., on the part of the prosecution, feel that the attack made on the court and the killing and wounding which followed were the most wanton and murderous character. Yet, at the quashing of the prosecution, will restore quiet in the case, they are willing to have it quashed. When the contents of your telegram was made known to them, and they were led to suppose that the Honorable Secretary of the Interior wished the case of Beck dismissed, they acquiesced without trouble. The National Council, however, is the only power under the Cherokee Constitution competent to dismiss the case. That council will convene an annual session on the first Monday in November next. They will no doubt pass an amnesty act to cover the case of Sutback and others if the U.S. government demands it. I have received a letter from N.J. Temple, U.S. District Attorney, the Western District of Arkansas, dated October 21st, 1873, in which he says, I was directed by the Attorney General of the United States to dismiss the case of the U.S. versus Zeke Proctor and others for murder in Going State Districts, but was further directed that the authorities of the Cherokee Nation should attempt to prosecute any of the Marshall's party to reindict Proctor and his party. That was the end of the quote. While I am perfectly willing, in this was John B. Jones' letter, to have the Marshall's party go free if it is thought best by the authorities at Washington, I wish it distinctly understood that I consider them guilty of a most flagrant crime versus peaceable, unoffending, and unarmed citizens. Of course, I make no excuse or even palliation of the original crimes of Ezekiel Proctor. In his case, the law should have had its course. But whatever the enormity of Proctor's crimes, they do not in the least excuse a murderous assault on the circuit court of Going State District. The judge of that court, B.H. Sixkiller, is a man whose character for probity is above suspicion. I have known him for many years intimately, 
and know him to be an excellent man. He was unarmed, presiding over the court. The jurors and witnesses were unarmed. Also, the attorney sent in court. Johnson Proctor, a spectator, was unarmed. The prisoner, of course, was unarmed and had been on that morning unchained on being brought before the court. The sheriff and his posse, of course, were well armed, as it was their duty to be. These men were attacked, killed, wounded, etc., as before described, and then 21 of them were indicted for murder on the testimony of the, of the surviving part of the marshal's force, who were themselves the perpetrators of the outrage. It was with this view, the case that I made the request to the Attorney General to have the proceedings, the first of six filler and scraper and others dismissed. It was on such representation that Honorable Secretary of Interior and Commissioner of Indian Affairs endorsed my request. It was not a matter of expedience to restore peace among criminals. It was a matter of justice. The quashing of the prosecution was asked for on behalf of men who were not guilty of any crime, but were prosecuted most unjustly. I have the honor to be very respectfully your obedient servant John B. Jones, U.S. Agent for the Cherokees. So according to the Journal of the Cherokee Senate of November 24, 1873, the Senate passed Senate Bill 8, suspending the prosecution of Sutbeck and others implicated in the Boeing Snake tragedy. Thus, the case against Proctor and his associates was dismissed by order of the Attorney General of the United States, then in turn, the case against Sudbeck and others was dismissed by order of the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation and later confirmed by the National Council. So this tragedy brought to light the problem of jurisdictional issues between the Cherokee Nation and the U.S. court system in 1872. Now, 150 years later, we have the problem of jurisdictional issues between the Cherokee Nation and the state of Oklahoma. So that concludes my presentation. So hopefully, uh, I hope to get someone to talk about the McGurk case next month, or at least in a in the near future. So 150 years later, we still have the jurisdictional issues with the court. Mm. Hey, Jack, I wanted to ask a question about the case. Um, um, not the case, but the, the, act, the, the historical activities that you were talking about that pre preceded the, the incident. Um, I was at the uh, U.S. Marshals uh, presentation in Fort Smith about a week or two ago where they gave a talk on the same subject. Um, and I'm quite surprised at the differences between your presentation and theirs. Um, so for, for one thing, uh, I mean, all, they were leaning towards the U.S. Marshals side a, a little bit at least, not, not completely, but... Um, one of the things that they mentioned uh, about the um, sister of Ezekiel Proctor is that it's alleged that he was married to, to uh, uh, Chesterson or whatever, Kesterson, but um, that, that she was married to, to him. But they said, oh, there's no way, no proof of that in any record. So they were almost dismissive of that charge that there was a prior incident where, um, where he had mistreated uh, Proctor's sister and abandoned her, her in go, uh, Canadian district. So I was just wondering, you know, did you have, uh, your sources are just completely unavailable to them or what, what's going on yeah. there? No, they're available to them. And uh, like I said, that's, that's the story. All I know is that they definitely were married and they're, 
Zeke's sister and at least one of their children is buried under the name of Casterson in Johnson Cemetery in the Proctor section. Yeah. And uh, as an aside, one of the most interesting things for me at that meeting was that I got to get my hands on Zeke Proctor's Spencer Carbine rifle and hold it <laughs> in my hands, the same one that he used at the shootout. And uh, it was just an amazing experience, you know, to see this, this old gun. Um, it, it's in really nice condition and uh, the, the wood and the metal just has this really smooth, uh, interesting look to it. it it must be a priceless item well i have my doubts that he had it at the shootout because he was unarmed didn't they say though that he that he brought the gun out at, and and though in this, the shootout it was, it was a spitzer carbine which was a rifle yeah well it's a wonder anybody survived Yes. With that close quarters. Yes. Yeah, there is a description in those court records that Sheriff Jack Wright describes the building itself. The doors, windows, door wow. windows, et cetera. There was some, uh, well, the, the last time I remember being in Fort Smith, Jack and I and somebody else was there. And... Uh, some fella who'd done a lot of research over there wanted to make some big issue of the fact that Chief Downey had planned the whole thing because he moved the trial to the court to the the schoolhouse because it was more defensible and blah blah blah. And I, we the talk was about how are we going to interpret this event in the Marshall's Museum because it reflects very poorly on them. You know, they were uh, couldn't control their posse and they were drunk and they weren't supposed to be there and their system fell down because nobody should have issued a warrant from Fort Smith to begin with and on and on. <laughs> and we haven't been asked back as far as I know to come to any of their events because I said, what did they think was going to happen if you start running two abreast with your rifles cocked toward a, a setting court? What do you think is going to happen? And another good point is that having the backs on the posse when they were, you know, a, a family member of theirs is, is uh, alleged to have been killed. So how is it that they are legally have a right to be on the posse, you know, where they're going to be serving a warrant uh, for the death of their own family member? That, that doesn't make any sense at all. Of course, there uh, about that, Jack just gave an account where whoever was at the door indicated that the marshal that came up there wasn't menacing. It was just when they let White Sut back in there, he just opened up fire on Zeke. Yeah. And uh, I, this Jack probably lays it out better than ever any I've ever heard it before. I mean, it makes it... Uh, much more plain, uh, you know, what One thing he didn't put in the talk was, uh, and Dr. Ballinger, he had interviewed the Whitmire sons and so on, and as part of it, in his writing, which is at the Newberry Library in Chicago, along with the rest of Ballinger's papers, he says, Detective Marshal J.G. Owen and his posse arrived at Going State Courthouse about 11 o'clock Monday morning of April 15, 1872. And he said, some of the posse was considerably under the influence of intoxicants. They had stopped at the Widow Whitmire's to get two shotguns just a few minutes before their arrival at the courthouse, and she urged them not to go, reminding some of them that they were too drunk to be entirely responsible. But one of them replied in derision that when these Indians heard his shotgun belch forth, they would run like turkeys. So, and then also with the Whitmire's, which of course there was the, the close house, 
Uh, it was later in the afternoon, Mrs. Whitmire had her son, Stephen Eli, hitch the mules to the wagon and haul the dead over to her house. Here they were prepared for burial and laid out on the long front porch. United States Marshal Owens and Black Set Beck died during the night. The following day, the friends of some of the dead came for the bodies and the rest were buried there in the Whitmire family graveyard. And then I had to count that while they were buried there, then many of them were moved later to their own family cemeteries. But the one young man, Riley Woods, his gravestone is still there in the Whitmire Cemetery. He died that day. But does that, Troy, does that bring us back to McGirt with this McGirt, the same problems of court jurisdiction? Well, I'm not up on McGirt. I never, I never read it. I, 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 I thought it was going to be a nightmare uh, when it first came down. Um, and I'm just not, uh, I, I, the the one thing I I caution about, I think tr the tribes, yes, we want to grab every scrap of sovereignty that we can, but we need to be very mindful that we continue, even today, we're at the very whims of the Congress, and what McGirt said was. Congress never disestablished your reservation. If we're not very cautious, a political tide can turn and the Congress can say, well, we're not going to disestablish you all together, but by golly, we are for these purposes. This is too confusing. So I'm, um, I, I just want us to proceed with extreme caution and really consider uh, the practicality of of our decisions, but I'm not I'm not up on what's happened. I haven't read up on it, and it's been the hot topic for I, for my CLE credits. I listened to what everybody was saying, but I will promise you that was not enough <laughs> to, to cause me to have any uh, it, uh, to be able to speak to it. It's very. Yeah. Uh, one of the latest uh, editions of the Tulsa Law Review um, has a bunch of different Indian lawyers um, giving their interpretations of the McGirt case and discussing it. So it's pretty interesting. It's available online as a PDF um, and pretty interesting reading, I think. Jack, there was a, excuse me, go oh. ahead, um, there was a lady that spoke on the second day of the of the going snake at the Marshalls Museum, and her name was Stacy Leeds. Yes, and she gave a really good presentation on the five major court cases in Cherokee history where Cherokee jurisdiction was take, taken over. And her last one that she did name was the McGirt. So. She, Anything you can get on her, she, she has a really good knowledge of it. Now, Stacy's very good. We've known Stacy for many, many years. And Billy, I think I took your picture there. I just didn't recognize you offline. <laughs> uh, were you the one who took the picture of me holding the gun? I think so, yeah. Oh. Little short, chunky girl. <laughs> well, Zeke's great, great, great granddaughter. That. <laughs> uh, that absolutely made my day and the day of many of my friends who uh, were just astonished that they let me hold that rifle. Uh, and I, I just went up there and asked them if they would let me uh, hold it. And they just said, put some gloves on and sure. And so next thing you know, I was holding up that rifle. Well, I got my picture made with the rifle, but I didn't hold it. <laughs> it's it's really cool. I've not been a much of a gun enthusiast in my life, but I came away from that wanting a wondering if I could get a copy of that rifle. And I found out that well, they do make one a, a working version in Italy, 
that's a, an exact replica of it. Um, but you have to put out about fifteen hundred dollars to buy it. So that was excuse me, that was the rifle and not the uh, pistols. Right, it was the well. They okay. also had his pistol, but I I was more interested in the rifle. I I just yeah. once but I got the rifle would have would have been the one crazy. described. Yeah. And yeah. oh, you're on mute, Vicky. Vicky, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it was the pearl handled pistol. That's going to be, that is owned by the uh, Sheriff's, I mean, the Marshall's Museum. But the, the Sharp rifle is um, on, loan, on, lo on loan from somebody from the Proctor family. Okay. It's definitely not my part of the Proctor family. But they did show that the exhibit that they're going to do for Going Snake, it will be, um, it's going to, it's a really intricate exhibit. And um, the people actually that are doing the display that have been working on this display for five years were rewriting it after they attended the conference. Which may or may not be a good thing. Correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had wanted to go last weekend, but like I said, I was tied up here in Oklahoma City. So, so I'm glad that y'all were able to go. You just wear too many hats, Jack. At times, <laughs> last month it's been that way. <laughs> so, because I've had this, like, this last week, I don't know how many meetings I've had. I've had like Three in one day, and two in another day. <laughs> this event would certainly make people in the area think twice about attending a court when it was in session. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I did find it interesting that the very next day, the 16th, when Jack Wright was writing his account, that he said that it may become of national importance. Near three weeks later, the president was yeah. And it took uh, an act from the Attorney General of the United States to dismiss it. So, the words of wisdom. The points that they did make is that they're still discussing this case 150 years later, <laughs> which, is, which is amazing. I mean, how many years, usually a court case is over, done, we're through with it. But them to be still discussing it 150 years later, I think that kind of sets a precedence. And thanks for giving us the link, Christine. Yeah, certainly they were, the marshals were trying to established that this that, that they believed that they were intervening on behalf of a U.S. citizen and uh, luckily uh, Catherine Foreman Gray was there to represent the Cherokee Nation and she had a very good rebuttal that you know that, that this man had married uh, a Cherokee Nation citizen and was living in the Cherokee Nation with all the rights and privileges thereof and then once once something bad happened to him, oh, let's run to Fort Smith and look for um, protection from the United States. So he wanted to have it both ways is the way it appears to be. <laughs> but it was quite clear from the Treaty of 1866 that he fell under Cherokee jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. I enjoyed that. Sure, you're welcome. Well, Jack, their business before we adjourn. I have one question about the the map that you you showed from the Raglan collection, yes. showing the the old Going State Courthouse lo location. Yes. I wonder if that's a mistake. Oh, I. Uh, don't I believe so because I 
remember seeing the remnants of that log building many really? years ago. Okay. Actually, let's. So there, yeah. there was another location later, later on, further up the creek. Oh yes, there was. And this map, this is only a part of that section. The map shows the other one, which was there at Strawberry Springs. By the, by the Going Snake right, Community, which is right, right up. Yeah. Just, just off uh, the right, top right of the there. there. Yeah, and that is okay. on this map also. And H. D. Ragland, I believe he was a Methodist minister and was in Dallasaw for a while, but he did this huge collection of historic sites with maps and interviews with people for every county in Oklahoma. And it was done in the 1950s. Wow. And it, it's just amazing what all is in there, the detailed maps that he has. And th those maps include uh, the Talentiski Courthouse. Shows right where it was, The sec just like these. Shows the township and section and what have you. Jack, uh, going back to the part, uh, who actually, what official actually issued the, the warrant for Zeke Proctor? Uh, it, it seems like that whoever issued it really didn't have the authorities, my recollection. Have they ever addressed that, the, the marshal people that are looking for justification for having a bunch of drunks disrupt our uh, court proceedings? Well, I mean, they had the marshals killed, so then the court there started, I've forgotten which, because this was before Judge Parker, he came along. No. No, I'm talking. I'm talking about the original warrant for uh, uh, for Zeke to to start with. That they they said they were down there uh, 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 serving a warrant, or they they had a reason to be there. I think that the official that issued it didn't have the authority to do it. The magistrate or whoever it was. Didn't he go on his own? That was. Well, uh, let me. Oh, uh, that well. I think it was James O. Churchill, I believe, was the one who signed that. Yeah, and who who was he? What you'll see him in a lot of the court records there. Uh, I mean, he was a U.S. commissioner. Commissioner of what? I don't know, but, but it, but that's the way he signs it as U.S. Commissioner, and I think it's it's part of the federal court there. But it's James, James O. Churchill. Yeah, I, I think I ought to look into that and see what real authority he had to be uh, issuing warrants to commence with. So. But it was, it's interesting, still talking about it 150 years later and debating it. <laughs> okay. Well, if we don't have any other further business, I will declare our meeting adjourned.